used to being a commuter where like I can autopilot for an hour and like, nope, nope. I have to be responsible and drive now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hello. Okay. Well, I think that folks are going to just trickle in and um, Naomi, if you wouldn't mind just letting folks in. Okay. Cool, I will get us started. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, this is Building Dialogue. Building Dialogue is Historic Seattle's discussion group. Thank you very much for joining us on this Wednesday um, after what I'm sure for most of us was a work day. Super excited to have this discussion with you. Um, if it's your first time here, especially thank you for joining us. And if you were part of Building Dialogue in the fall, welcome back. I'm Taylor Roden. I'm the Community Events Manager here at Historic Seattle. And I do want to just acknowledge all of my Historic Seattle colleagues. Um, so if you work at Historic Seattle, you can either wave or wave so that everyone knows who you are. Naomi, Simon, Eugenia, Jeff, Bailey. That's everyone I can see in the grid so far. Um, yes, the team here is awesome. Uh, so why we're awesome is that our mission is saving meaningful places to foster lively communities. And we've got a great you know, discussion ahead of us, but before we get into our discussion questions, I do want to thank all of our sponsors for their ongoing support of our work. Um, specifically, thank you to Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, Local One, Washington and Alaska, Daniels Real Estate, The Greystone and The Lodge, St. Edward Park, and Selin Construction. Um, and we also want to acknowledge that our properties and our programs occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. This acknowledgement is absolutely not a substitute for developing relationships with indigenous communities, nor is it um, a substitute for honoring indigenous stories as we share our collective history, but it's a first step in recognizing the people whose land we occupy. And the acknowledgement that I just read is borrowed from the City of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture and our um, team here at Historic Seattle is working to develop our own land acknowledgement and you will hear that from us, I think starting in February. So stay tuned for that. Um, but today we are discussing two Vanishing Seattle films, Capitol Hill Arts District and Central District Wanawari. Vanishing Seattle documents and celebrates the disappearing and displaced small businesses, homes, communities and cultures of Seattle. And we're really excited because the Vanishing Seattle founder, Cynthia Brothers, is here with us and will be joining our discussion. So Cynthia, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and introducing yourself and saying hello, that'd be great. Thanks, Taylor. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to Historic Seattle and staff. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. I um, was really looking forward to this all week. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Cynthia Brothers. I'm the founder of Vanishing Seattle. It's a project that I started in 2016 and have been running on a um, pretty much as a uh, passion project um, for the past almost five years. Um, in addition to that, uh, for my day job, I'm a program officer with the Four Freedoms Fund, which is a national immigrant justice collaborative that works to build the capacity of the immigrant rights movement. Um, and then uh, the free time that I <laughs> have left, I uh, organized as a member of the Chinatown International District or the CID Coalition, um, which was a group uh, that formed in 2017 to do work around um, cultural preservation and anti-displacement. Um, yeah, so uh, the film series was completed. Um, most of it was filmed pre-pandemic, <laughs> but it was um, completed and published late last year and just super excited to um, share them with you all and to uh, yeah have it kind of be the fodder for our discussion today so thanks a lot. Thank you Cynthia. All right oh and so sorry I did not mean to turn your video off I actually just meant to remove your spotlight whoops <laughs> here we go and we're back. Okay so um Super excited again to have you with us. Thank you, thank you. This is a really, really exciting partnership for us. Um, we're about to get into our discussion questions and cannot wait to hear from all of you. But before we do that, I do want to just share with you all the discussion guidelines. Many of you received these, um, or all of you should have received it actually in the confirmation email, but I am going to just share um, a slide and review them together since so many of us are new to Building Dialogue. So give me one moment and... 
we will review these as a group. I feel like my mom, she's a teacher and it's kind of funny that I'm doing like what she normally does. So for today's discussion and for all of our building dialogue um, discussions, we really want you all to self-regulate the same way that we would if we were having this uh, meeting in person. Please be courteous and please avoid interrupting when someone else is speaking. If we find that you know everyone is so excited and everyone wants to share, or a lot of people want to share on the same question, um, you can raise your hand or like use the raise your hand button, and then we'll call on you in the order that, or I will call on you in the order that I see you appear. Um, and we may not get to everyone depending on you know how you know excited we are about these discussion questions. There are kind of a lot of them, but we'll absolutely do our best to get to everyone in the time that we have today. Um, and if you've already had a chance to speak uh, and you're not sure if, if someone else wants to say something, maybe just pause a little bit and then allow others the opportunity to unmute and share. If um, we get really excited and we start having some tangents, I would just encourage you all to make use of the chat feature to add any comments or even share other resources or related information to the discussion. And we also want to acknowledge that we are all different people. That's part of what makes you know discussions like these really exciting. And um, we want you all to um, be respectful of one another and keep our discussion today civil. We want to listen and learn and explore together and want to make it very clear that racism, sexism, homophobic comments, discriminations, and insults will not be tolerated. Naomi is um, the co-host and she can absolutely mute and boot as needed. Hopefully we won't have to do that. We haven't yet. Don't know why we would today, but so we're all clear. These are our guidelines and I know that we're going to have an awesome convo. So with that, I'm going to open it up. Oh, and the way that it'll work, just so that everyone knows is I will um, go through our list of discussion questions. I'll read the question aloud, and um, when you have something to share, go ahead and unmute yourself and share. And then I'll just kind of guide us through each one of the questions. And when we reach about 620, 625-ish, I'll give us all a warning to get kind of our final thoughts and feels out there. And then um, we'll do some announcements, and then we'll all go about the rest of our evenings. So yay, building dialogue, here we go. So our first question um, for the two films that we all watched, which were Capitol Hill Arts District again and Central District Wanawari is, uh, the, the Capitol Hill film in particular opens with a series of definitions of the term progress. Um, so how do you all define progress and do you see this progress in Capitol Hill in the Central District today? And unmute and discuss. Any takers to be first? And if we're not loving it, we can skip to the next question, but I feel like someone does have a good response to this. Just a hunch. Eugenia. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm wearing gloves inside my house because we don't have heat right now. <laughs> so it's just sort of like... <laughs> um, I thought that was actually the... When watching it, I um, what stood out to me is uh, like to me, I think oftentimes someone thinks of progress as getting getting rid of the old and just bringing the new. And um, so what we historically say, always struggle with this all the time because if you equate progress with just new, then that means you know more older buildings are being torn down, more historic buildings are being torn down. Um, and you really, uh, to have a really great neighborhood, you kind of have to have both. And um, and then also to me, progress is, isn't necessarily um, equated with uh, financial progress either. I think one of the, um, one of the um, folks in the movie said that. Uh, I thought that was a really good point. Um, and I definitely agree with that. So it's sort of, there are a lot, I think people have different definitions of it for sure. Um, and it, it seems like to me, progress should be a positive, should be a positive thing instead of a negative thing. And, um, un unfortunately, um, what, what, uh, what's been happening, um, has, can oftentimes have more of a negative impact on a neighborhood. And, and we see that when, when, what 
attracted people to a neighborhood to begin with gets lost because um, you know they 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 like what was there to begin with what what the character whether it's the neighborhood character or the people or the culture and then by um, destroying that you're getting rid of what what attracted people there to begin with or what makes people want to stay there to begin with. Thank you. I, I second that. I agree with all that. I, I also want to add that progress from my perspective, um, and, and I think what I took away from the film as well, what is, is more holistic, or it should be more holistic and all-encompassing and not just singularly focused on the financial, which is really what I'm seeing in a lot of areas, not just Capitol Hill. Thanks so much. Judith? Yeah, it's Judy for everybody. The only person I know on this call, on this program is Eugenia. And um, first of all, I wanna say <clears throat> how thrilled I am to see so many young faces because <laughs> I'm a Seattle old timer, but I'm getting older, you know, and I wanna see people step up and be part of something vibrant. And that's what we're losing is vibrancy. And I think it's because our city has not set up a set of priorities for what makes a neighborhood wonderful and what makes our communities wonderful. So Capitol Hill has had vibrant art community, um, just uh, overwhelming gay, lesbian, LGBT uh, folks who could coalesce um, it's got terrific restaurants. <laughs> so that, it's had that set of vibrancy for a long time. The central district has had the black community, which has been frittered away because our city really hasn't felt highly about them ever. Um, one of my neighbors when I, in 1970 was a jazz musician. He was the only white jazz musician his wife was black. Uh, so I got to have a sense of what that community was a long time ago, and it's not there anymore. So what is it that we really want to see our city do, and how do we help it focus to make those a priority? Um, I go back way to Jane Addams, you know, and say, what is a neighborhood? <laughs> It's a neighborhood where you can walk around. It's a neighborhood where you have stores. It's a place where people know you. It's where ideas percolate up. And um, it's, it's becoming so unifyingly boring to look at buildings that are happening, which are priced out of everybody's existence now. So I met Eugenia through a challenge to what was the mandatory housing legislation and she testified in that case, and I was one of the attorneys on the case. Um, and through Eugenia's wonderful help, we're one of the, my neighborhood, which is Ravenna Cowan that surrounds the parks, is one of the few that became a national historic district. Um, so we managed to weather part of that. So we're not seeing the terrible stuff that's happening. So I really like to focus on what's the politics of it? How do we get people in who understand what the dynamic is, a vibrant dynamic for culturally living community. And that's my take. Thank you, Judy. Um, we're gonna come back to some of the questions that you post with our next couple of questions, but I do want to um, call on Cynthia Shelley. Hi, um, my apologies for the mask. I had someone doing work in my house and they haven't been gone for an hour yet. <laughs> but, um, um, I think there's a really interesting difference between the word progress as it's defined in progressive politics, which is about inclusion and broadening and uh, evening things out versus how it's usually talked about with uh, land use and development, which is about, I'm not sure how to say it but politely, uh, tearing things down and building other things to make money. And, um, I've often been really surprised at things that are that are that the city in particular has allowed and been encouraged to be 
redeveloped uh, the churches and university district being a top of mind example like i'm always shocked that it's legal to tear down something like that and when you look into it it seems like it's not just legal but encouraged um, and yet when i think about you know, progressive politics it was another weird thing where a lot of people involved in progressive politics want more housing at any cost but when i think about you know, sort of the ideas of expansion and inclusion it's not about tearing down the things that were there before it's about embracing all different kinds of people in all different kinds of environments and i there's just a weird tension there that i i can't resolve yeah. thank you and cynthia your comments and judy's actually relate to the next um couple of questions. I think I'm going to combine them because they are related. Um, so to, to your point, those displaced by gentrification and development um, can often easily identify the negative consequences of both, um, but did want to discuss or have you all discuss what, if any, are the positive aspects? You know, what, what are the negative and positive effects of gentrification, especially for um, um, Black and Indigenous people of color and artists and small businesses. And I think to Judy's specific questions, what are meaningful investments or improvements that mutually benefit current and future residents as well as community members? And the question I skipped is kind of related to this. It was, why is place an important part of cultural identity? So there's a lot there. Um, and feel free to tackle any <laughs> one of the layers of that question. <laughs> I don't see a hand, but feel free to just unmute. I think there's an interesting, to change neighborhoods a little bit, looking at the Yesler Terrace redevelopment and seeing, I think the documentary did a great job of noting how there are a bunch of vacant storefronts that contractors are developing, but are being filled. And then you go to Yesler Terrace redevelopment and you've got two go coffee and, and, new BIPOC owned businesses that are in these buildings. And I'm like, holy crap, look at that. You got a spiffy, nice new build out. Um, and uh, a good friend of mine who's an artist just completed an installation there. And like, there's, so there's elements of what political progress looks like um, in, in those developments, but that comes at the cost of uh, housing development that a lot of people I know and love grew up in and had their whole lives take place in. And I mean, it is, if you took somebody from 1995 and yes, or Terrace and dropped them there now until you look at the skyline, you wouldn't know the difference or you would, you would not be able to tell it's the same neighborhoods. Thanks Simon. Anyone else have a thought? And I thank you, Bailey, for the suggestion. I put the question in the chat since it was quite a mouthful. I guess I kind of wonder why, I know a lot of people feel this way and I don't really get it. The idea that something new is necessarily better. Um, some of my favorite spaces have been repurposed spaces and like, the fact that it doesn't quite fit and things are a little quirky and crooked makes them better, in my opinion. Like I walk into a brand new building and it, it's boring. It feels, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I know that a lot of people really like shiny new. And I guess, you know, it's a different of difference of aesthetic, but for people who prefer shiny and new, it probably is better to, be able to move into a brand new apartment with, you know, new wiring and stuff. That's nice too. <laughs> Thanks, Cynthia. Any other thoughts on this? Anyone want to tackle, you know, what the benefits or positive effects of gentrification might be? Safe space. Um, maybe I'll just say quickly that I kind of struggled with this question a bit because my immediate reaction <laughs> and my own biases are to be like gentrification is a dirty word and it's a bad process. Um, I think, yeah, there are some silver linings and some positive. It's not totally, you know, either or, but on the, 
on balance, you know, it, it generally is conceived as like a pretty, you know, bad thing for a lot of folks, you know, lived experience. Um, and also, you know, with like development, I think development is inherently not a good or a bad thing. It's like, what is, to what end, you know, what impact does it have? Who is it serving or not? Um, I will say through like the making of film, these films, Wanamari included, um, something that I did find really inspiring that came about as a um, result of gentrification and displacement and speculative development was the community responses to that. So folks being resistant and resilient and super creative and organizing and get to get, getting together and um, you know, not accepting that this is just a part of progress <laughs> or it's like the way that things have to be um, and creating new models and building community um, as an avenue to demonstrate that there's an alternative. And, you know, again, Wanawari, they didn't just, you know, create that space um, and that house of art to resist displacement. They're working on an organizing model with black homeowners in the CD. And that's something that they want to scale. And I think those are things that folks can, you know, replicate and adapt and, you know, resist in their own context. So. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, it was a tough question. And I, I wrote the question and then had to sit and really come up with an, my own response. And I appreciate those are <laughs> the best <laughs> So thank you. I checked my own post-it. So thank you for, <laughs> for sharing. Um, Judy? Just, I just want to second what Toby Thaler just said in the chat. Um, the, the thing with gentrification is it means that people who are poor can't live there anymore. <clears throat> and so they're being ousted from their neighborhoods. And as Toby points out, there are ways to stop that, but we haven't had the leadership to do that. Um, you can insist that a certain percentage of housing ha have sliding income, anything that's built. And our city didn't do that. But that would have ensured, <coughs> excuse me, that would have ensured that at least, I mean, to me, a vibrant neighborhood has people of every stripe. That makes a place interesting. Income-wise, race-wise, um, all different kinds of views. That's, that's, to me, what something is wonderful about. And the way that Seattle's been approaching this, it hasn't been like that. So they had options to say, well, OK, we're going to allow developers. We know we need more housing because we've had this influx of people who are getting a lot of money, and they need a place to live. And we don't have it here in Seattle. But they could have put parameters on it that they didn't. And that's, I think, what the real problem is. Thank you, Judy. Yeah. Eugenia? Um, one of the things in, uh, in the Capitol Hill Arts District um, film, um, they talked about the, all the vacant spaces in the new buildings, um, the new multifamily, the mixed use buildings, and um, how for months or years they're vacant and the developers make their money from the, from the housing, not so much from the retail spaces. And I know the city, the, they just recently passed, um, or the Office of Arts and Culture, the new cultural spaces agency. So I'm really excited to hopefully see, uh, one of their goals is to work with developers um, to um, activate these spaces so that, you know, for artists and, um, and folks who you know, need the spaces but otherwise couldn't afford it otherwise. So it'd be really interesting if they can be that matchmaker and find developers who are saying, yeah, you know, we'd rather have these spaces activated and have people in the community um, use them rather than just have them sitting vacant or become yet another bank or, you know, <laughs> like another, another, um, uh, use that you can kind of see anywhere in any neighborhood. Um, so I think that's a really good goal. I'm hoping with some time that that'll be successful. If it is, that, that would, I think, really be helpful. Um, 
Yeah. So I, I know Cynthia and I, we've been involved with the, the building art space equitably um, uh, group. And so hopefully that, that'll, that'll uh, uh, keep moving forward. Thanks, Eugenia. And actually, I'm gonna, to your point, I think, move us slightly out of order, which is whatever. If we don't like it, then we'll go to the question that was actually next. But um, the question that I'm putting in the chat right now is, um, can you think of examples of how specific policies have informed or are informing change in your own neighborhood or in our city or specific neighborhoods? And I think, thank you, Eugenia, for getting us started. And then I'll come back to the question that I skipped, um, but since we're here. The upzoning, I think. I, I actually just moved out of Capitol Hill. Um, not as much fun to live there during a, during the lockdown, but <laughs> um, I think the upzoning really. I sort of understand why they went with this with the arterials only, but it means that when you're moving through the city on a bus or in a car, that you no longer see interesting buildings. Like some of my favorite houses in the city were things that were sort of out of place on a busy street. Uh, 23rd used to have a lot of really great houses and that's pretty much all of them are gone. Um, and that's you know, the whole length, way up in Montlake and, and down to probably past Jackson. Um, and I think that's had a really negative effect on how the city feels to be passing through it. Um, if you go, you know, if you go into the neighborhoods, then there's still a lot of preserved housing. But if you, but on the parts that most people see, there isn't. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, thank you, Jeff. I hope you don't mind, Jeff, but I'm going to read what you put in the chat. Um, Jeff shared, both neighborhoods are un undergoing rapid change in gentrification. Uh, the quote, gay ghetto, which was tied to the neighborhood being an arts community, is struggling to keep that identity. Many who want that sense of community have moved to other cities like Kent, absolutely, um, and beyond even. And thank you, Toby, um, also for sharing in the chat. Um, Toby shared, up zones without mitigation, up zones without mitigation um, for impacts, the core of displacement in my neighborhood. We are seeing many sound older rental units torn down and replaced with townhouses. Um, same, honestly. I'm on the border of Mount Baker and Columbia City and some days I really have to <laughs> do a double take to remember where I'm at. Um, if, if there's no one else who has thoughts on this question, I'll go back to the question that I skipped, um, which is whose responsibility is it to preserve culture and community in neighborhoods and cities in the midst of this rapid growth and development? And what are some ways to accomplish this uh, preservation? And I promise you, this is not a leading question just because we're historic Seattle. <laughs> I really do want to hear what you all think about this. Any takers? Well, I think oh. Cynthia Brothers had a really great point about out of these struggles become these community networks that really celebrate these and obviously vanishing seattle is a great example of that um and so and to judah's point as well like a lot of it is young folks learning from the history of these neighborhoods as they become of adult age and can utilize capitol hills bars and restaurants and so it's kind of a revolving door about we're the culture makers, but we also have to hold our account, our politicians and neighbors accountable too. about like, you know, are you going to sell your house? Are you going to give it to your kids? Are you going to do a God awful addition that completely changes your neighborhood or your, your lot? Um, so it's an interesting political and I don't know if etiquette's the right word, but how you exist in maybe citizenship is maybe the better right word. Um, how you exist in a greater community, I think, brings on who's responsible it is and, and who is responsible is, you know, the people who make these cities and also the people who make decisions at a higher level. Thanks, Simon. Anyone else have thoughts on this? Lynn? Uh, 
I'm going way back in time, but was there once upon a time, maybe under Wes Ullman, a neighborhood conservation plan or a neighborhood preservation plan to, to, to basically preserve the character of the neighbors, neighborhoods around Seattle? This is going back probably into maybe the early 90s or earlier. So the question, part of the question is, what responsibility does the city have to preserve um, the neighborhoods and neighborhoods could be commercial neighborhood. There are three things that sort of come to mind. One of them is the lack of community feeling and the lack of culture in terms of retaining the culture that exists or even in gentrification where people mix together, they share cultures and the third thing is basically um, you go down Broadway and it has no feeling anymore. It has no character. It's, it's tall buildings under with no character to them. The much of the townhouses, they look like something that might have been built shortly after the war and aren't going to last very long. So maybe some architectural requirements to make some of these neighborhoods as they're losing their character, retain part of the character. Anyway, that's my thoughts. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Cynthia? I oh. really struggle with what to do about this because I do a lot of work around progressive politics and most of the people I work with on other issues are very pro housing, 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 and don't really seem to, you know, and if I start trying to talk about preservation or it, I, I get a lot of, oh, you're just a NIMBY. Um, and it's like, well, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and I, I, I really struggle with how to affect change here because it seems like the city council who I agree with about a lot of other things just can't see past market-based solutions. Doesn't want to regulate, doesn't want to make value judgments about what a city should be. Just, oh, well, we have people who can't afford housing let's build more housing, which ends up, you know, the new housing that gets built is all expensive, so it doesn't really help. And I don't know, y'all have been doing this particular kind of work a lot longer than I have, so maybe you have some ideas on where I can actually plug in and make a difference. So it doesn't seem like the city council wants to do this. Thanks, Cynthia. I, I saw a hand, but I can't remember whose hand it was, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> oh yes, please go ahead, Judy. The question was, a his, there was a question about the history on conservation districts, but before there was the history of conservation districts, there was the history of neighborhood planning. And, and this went back to the 1970s and 80s. And you had people at the then uh, city department where it started from the ground up. And everything we've seen now is from the top down. So not everything, but, uh, but a lot of things. They're just from the top down. And getting a voice in is very difficult. Conservation districts was a proposal by Tom Rasmussen. Um, and, and it went and went, somebody in my neighborhood who's an architect has the whole file on that. He got this from the archives <laughs> of the city council. Um, and it went nowhere. And one of the people on the council now who's trying to raise it again has been Lisa Herbold, who has talked about at least having conservation for things that are important to the community. So you might have a coffee shop, <laughs> you know, or you have a place where people congregate and being able to designate that in some way is something that shouldn't get offed in the development process is one of the suggestions that's come up. Thank you, Judy. And thanks, Toby, for um, your comment in the chat um, that the city owes our communities both good policies and capital, absolutely. Um, and that empowering existing communities is a great way to kind of not transfer the responsibility, but share it and empower folks who are being affected by the development to not only tell their own stories, but make their own decisions about what's happening um, in their lives. So thank you for that contribution. And I feel like I saw another hand. 
um, but the, my particular chat is a little bit active, so apologies if I missed you, but please share. No? Okay. Representative Santos, thank you for joining us, by the way. No, thank you for allowing me to join all of you. I've been anxious to uh, plug in, but uh, I have not really had a lot of time to do so. Um, I just want to make a couple of observations that I hope will lead to the question of who's responsible. Um, and I uh, really want to thank Cynthia for all of your work. Uh, I've been a longtime follower and have appreciated um, your efforts to elevate um, the concerns that I'm hearing around the table here, not the table, the screen. Um, and it's, I think, I, I'm going to, obviously I, I come to this table a little bit as a policymaker, but um, I think what many of you may not know is that I actually, um, by education, uh, am an historian and um, have specialized in particularly uh, social history um, and the importance of community. And um, I think what was very interesting about the conversation around gentrification is that it was absolutely married to um, sort of whether it was a resignation or an acceptance or what have you, but it was clearly about gentrification as a um, either a motivator or, or an effect of displacement, that that was just undisputed. And I think the question I have to ask is when you think about what are forces of gentrification, it is in many respects, it's about lifting up people from um, especially economic poverty into a place of greater stability. And what I guess the question I'm asking in my head is, what would happen, what would it look like if gentrification did not involve displacement, but actually was gentrification taking, um, occurring in place where you kept communities where they were. Um, and it um, suggests to me that really, when you look at all of the places that have been susceptible to what we identify commonly as gentrification, one of the common things is that it requires greater investments in people and in community. Um, investments in people's education, investment in people's ability to um, uh, obtain jobs that allow them to stay uh, where they are and to continue to invest in their community. I think the other thing is um, uh, it makes me wonder not wonder, but it makes me uh, contemplate um, why do we have also so much displacement? Some of you talked about the um, sort of the, I don't think anyone used this term, but the way it interpreted in my head was sort of the corporatization of um, like housing policies um, and the making room for more and bigger and higher um, and more glass and concrete. Um, because I agree with Cynthia's comments, which is, you know, I think what makes a city so unique and wonderful, and I don't care what city it is, is that when I can go to a city and I can actually still see the sky above the highest rooftops in the middle of their downtown area, that just makes it much more accessible. But I um, digress. Uh, when I talk, think again about gentrification and heightened displacement, I have to recall that in Seattle and in King County, we've had a huge influx of newcomers, huge. And um, when somebody asked the question about, and they were called preservation and planning districts, um, the um, notion of um, sort of keeping uh, the community for the community and helping to plan uh, really did kind of go um, out of the window as more and more newcomers kind of overwhelmed and overran um, many of our neighborhood communities. Um, and, and, and I don't say that as a judgment, I'm just saying that is that's what seemed to have happened coincidentally historically. 
And um, the question about what have been the roles of the um, uh, the uh, the preservation boards. Um, you know, those are, at least in Seattle, those are functions of our city government. And so they're following city policies. Um, and part of the challenge that I'm gonna go back to, how do we hold on to precious places like the central area or Capitol Hill? I was just lamenting the other day when we finally moved um, the Pride Parade from, well, finally, when they moved the Pride Parade from Capitol Hill down to, downtown, you know, there was a, it was a mixed blessing. And I really miss having it on Capitol Hill where you got to see the neighbors, you got to see the, you know, independent um, storefronts. Um, but these preservation boards sometimes make it more expensive for those who are actually already in the community and in the neighborhood to hold on to what they have. And so, um, I'm not offering like any kinds of solutions. I, I'm just sharing with you the thoughts that are going through my head as I'm listening to this very interesting uh, conversation. And I'm so glad that it's taking place. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, there were so many nuggets in there, um, but there was a theme that actually relates to the next question um, on our list. And that is, I mean, it was kind of an undercurrent, but what roles do rat, rat, race and class play in gentrification? Um, and I'll also put that in the chat for us, but um, kind of related to what Representative Santos just said, if anyone has um, some ideas there, would love to hear your thoughts. And feel free to just unmute. You don't have to um, raise your hand, especially since I keep missing the hands. Thank you, Toby, um, for, for your comment in the chat. Toby wrote, in America, everything. Um, yes, ditto to that. <laughs> Lots of plus ones. Toby, you're on mute, and I can see you have a piece of paper, but um, it was a little hard. Yeah, I was just holding it up to say displacement equals gentrification and colonialism. So I should not uh, get too engaged here because of my position, but I feel like I'm an ally to whatever I hear said here so far. Thank you. Any thoughts from anyone else? Eugenia? Um, it's also so much about resources and access to resources, um, whether it's being able to afford an attorney <laughs> or, um, you know, people who understand real estate and financial uh, mechanisms and all that. So um, that's very unequal and uneven um, depending on what community or neighborhood you're in. And, and having that, those, that expertise within your community is so important. Um, to help lend a voice to, to, to be able to navigate through, um, you know, a system that's very much against many people. Um, and and that, that's something that I know, I think a lot of some of the folks on this, in this meeting are trying to have, you know, spent their lives trying to, to fight against and to try to make things better for, for, for everyone. And that's so important. Thanks, Eugenia. I mean, a very, specific examples. I feel like it was just last week, maybe the week before I was talking to Naomi and had no idea how much it really does cost um, <laughs> to nominate a space um, or for a landmark designation, like the, the amount of hours and just work and consulting fees. I had no idea and my jaw kind of dropped uh, when Naomi shared a few figures with me and, um, you know, having access like you said, you need to those sort of resources so that you can preserve and landmark spaces. Looking around the city, it makes sense to me why um, spaces that otherwise I think would seem obvious that should be landmarked likely are not. So, anyone else have thoughts on this question? I know that we are. Simon? Oh, and you're on mute. There we go. Uh, obviously, gentrification has huge implications for both race and class, but 
also there's a there's a factor of operating a historic property is not cheap. Um, I serve as the facilities maintenance manager of the wonderful portfolio that has been saved and preserved by historic Seattle. And similar to your experience, Taylor, there's a lot of times where I'm like, I know how I have an idea of how much that's going to cost, but to actually do it, you know, is, is a different story. And I think a lot about how I've known multiple people who've lost homes because they couldn't, especially seniors who've lived in their homes their whole lives. And maybe a family member built that home. Um, if you can't upkeep it, can you keep it? And I think that that's an area where our city, our politicians, um, if we think about what's a valuable, vibrant streetscape or, or neighborhood, um, I've always been a big, big fan of, of having elders as neighbors. Um, and I think that there's an important history to that that comes with it. And when those people move away, you lose a lot with that as well. And I think that both, I mean, to tie into Eugenia's point a little bit too, like you lose that experience. You also lose that personal history. Um, that's really valuable. And I think that having that access to the, you know, different people in your neighborhood who've been there for a long time or, oh, my neighbor down the street does plaster work. Great. I can actually hire somebody to do plaster work if I own a plaster building. Whereas like that may not be, that may not be everywhere um, because I, a lot of the trades folks I know do not live in Seattle anymore and simply can't afford it. A lot of the service folks I know can't live in Seattle. I'm kind of an anomaly um, being very blessed to be able to stay living here. And so obviously there's the, the, the bigger conversation about what racial reconciliation and class reconciliation look like in terms of redevelopment of neighborhoods that haven't had a say or were forced into there and then forced development upon in the case of the central district. Um, but there's also kind of a, an element of how do we value people in our neighborhoods and make expertise and resources available in our neighborhoods so that we're aware of those things rather than I first learned about this when I went away to college or when I was in another city. Yeah, totally. Everything that you said totally resonates um, with my like personal experiences having grown up in Seattle and being bused across the city. And it just this question made me think about my entire education history um, and how different at times my education was from my sisters. We went to different middle schools in Seattle. And so she knows things that I don't because she stayed in the neighborhood and I know things that she does not know or we just had very different experiences and exposure. Um, and even our colleges, she went to a historically black college and I did not. And um, as adults now back in the same city, it is very interesting to have these conversations and be learning from each other and realize like, oh my gosh, there are huge gaps in the information that we both have as a result of what we were and were not exposed to. Um, and the diversity or lack thereof along the way in our education. So, yes. <laughs> Cynthia? I could just make a quick comment kind of circling back to this um, concept of gentrification we've been discussing and um, uh, Representative Santos and we talked about, you know, what if there were a different, um, you know, look to gentrification where it would mean investing back in communities and can we have gentrification without displacement? And um, to me, I feel like that's the million, or this is Seattle's maybe like the billion dollar question. Like, how do we, how do we do that? You know, to me, that might be called something different, like, I don't know, asset building or wealth building investment, whatever. But I feel like the ability to, um, yeah, keep or channel resources in communities so they can stay in place and build upon the you know strength and brilliance they already have as opposed to having to shove over <laughs> for you know somebody else i mean i feel like that is kind of you know the dream and what a lot of folks are you know working towards to be able to grow yet stay in place and have the, the freedom of choice to live where they want and with who they want so um yeah <laughs> that's a cool vision yes All right, so our next uh, question, coming back to the films in particular, let me not get out of order, putting it in the chat. Um, 
So having watched the films, um, the two that we assigned and really all of them, what new insights did you all gain from the films regarding placemaking and gentrification? Um, and are, were, there, were there specific stories or you know facts or anything, information in the films that you identify with or that really impacted you? Um, and if you have something that did kind of resonate or something that you heard, saw that caused some sort of reaction, would love to hear from you all about what that was. Um, I, I saw Cynthia and then Toby, Cynthia, Shelley, and then Toby, and yes. The Capitol Hill one made me homesick. Uh, even though I lived in Capitol Hill three months ago, it's a completely different neighborhood. And I was up by 15th, which isn't as impacted, but it's still like the those videos of, you know, grungy looking kids sitting on the street and the businesses and everything being just sort of comfortably run down and small scale and all these little businesses. And it, it was such a wonderful place. And, and, and there are very few neighborhoods like that in Seattle anymore, even if there are any, I don't know if there are. Capitol Hill certainly is not one anymore. Thanks, Cynthia. Toby? Well, <clears throat> I've experienced and dealt with displacement for a very long time. I remember working with uh, Operation Move In in up, uh, up West Side in New York City in the early 70s. And I uh, remember San Francisco, the International Hotel. Every neighborhood goes through change. We just need to empower those of us who are actually there now. New people sh should be able to come in, but they shouldn't control it. They, they should become a part of it and part of the control, but we should stop letting capital run things. That comment very early was spot on. Uh, if people want, I'll put a couple sites in the chat box for books. Is that appropriate? Fine. I work for the city council, so I'm really nervous about being very open and public here, but I'll give you some book sites. Organize, organize. Tell us what to do. Thank you, Toby. Yes, we would love your book recommendations in the chat, please and thank you. Anyone else have anything to share about this question? Eugenia? Oh, in the film, the Capitol Hill one, um, the gentleman, I don't remember his name, who talked about now he could go two weeks walking around and not know anyone. Uh, that was so sad to me because, you know, it used to be that he probably could would step out the door and would run into friends um, uh, like every five feet. And to have that change and to have a neighborhood that, you know, you just don't recognize anymore, um, that community that was there that's been lost, um, that's not something that you could just create out of thin air. So that that, that part really resonated with me. Anyone else? I don't want to skip over sharing if there's someone else who has something to share. Okay. Um, so our last question, and I just love how on time we are today. Um, and we've talked about this um, in various ways, but bringing it home and to our <laughs> very real present, um, what are some ways that we as individuals and as a collective can continue to support artists and preserve arts and cultural um, institutions, um, especially given the severe impacts of COVID? Um, we're coming up on a year and, uh, you know, it's still rough to say the least. Um, so I'd love to uh, hear your insights and ideas. And if you're waving at me, um, feel free to just unmute and share. Yeah, Cynthia, thanks for the Wanawari films. Marvelous. I uh, it's in my neighborhood. I live at 22nd and Cherry, and I have been there several times and always warmly welcomed. Uh, Ronald Hall's work was there back in February, and it was a wonderful exhibit. Um, the film really captured a wonderful sense of the place and uh, just such a wonderful asset in this neighborhood. And 
sadly, it feels um, like it's it's a vestige or something, or it's recreating something that once was. But uh, there there's a warmth and genuineness to that place, and every time I walk in it, it's just uh, uh, a wonderful feeling. So much appreciated. Thank you. Anyone else? You know, I, I think while businesses are predominantly shut down for their interiors, um, it'd be a great opportunity for a lot of small businesses to fix some of those things that are maybe beyond comfortably run down. Uh, they're a little scary, but, you know, there's just never a time to do it. Um, before I worked with Historic Seattle, I worked for the Pike Place Market PDA, and there's a reality that uh, there's 40,000 people who walk through there every day, and you can't fix those tiles that are broken Um Every morning, I would start by trying to fix one or two tiles, and whether or not a pallet jack got to it before the concrete set up was a gamble we had to play. And so I often think about what a more local um, habitat for humanity kind of thing would look like for for neighbors helping neighbors, or um, you know, larger scale for for commercial properties. We're closed down. What can we do? Is there some small grants available to you know even something like paint? can go a long way for a small business. Yes, thank you. Um, my mom years ago gifted me this like plaque and essentially it's very wordy, but what it essentially says is, you know, share what you have. Um, I think that speaks to what you were talking about, Simon. My sister is an artist and recently um, posted on her Instagram. I can't even remember the name of the group. I promise I'll find out. And when I send the follow-up that has all of these book recommendations, I'll include this, but it's it's a free um, art supply store that I think is in a garage or in a storage unit. Anyway, um, that was like a really just happy and pleasant surprise. I know so many artists right now can't actually afford supplies to create um, and make the statements that they need to make. So that was really heartwarming to see. When I cut someone off, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Could I, um, I know the uh, question is um, what, what can um, people do to preserve uh, the arts and culture and artists? Um, and um, I, I think I wanted to comment or piggyback on what Larry said. I think for me, what's always been very important. And, and I, again, in all full disclosure, I grew up in this district. I, you know, from the time I was a little girl, frequenting the central area, we called it the CD back then, um, to um, all the way to like Rainier Beach. Um, the thing is, I guess I, I would change the question a little bit because when I look at the Wanawari uh, film and when I speak um, uh, to um, the brain trust that uh, created that, it's, it's not about, it's less to me about arts and culture as much as it is about community and the community that preserves the arts and the culture. It's that sense of, as I think Larry said, feeling warmly welcome there. Um, and um, I just wanted to uh, share with all of you, if you were not aware, uh, that we did create um, in 2019, something that was called the Central District Community Preservation and Development Authority. Um, and it is, um, it was to put a stake in the ground um, to say, you know, there was a thriving um, uh, mixed race, but largely African American community that lived and flourished in the Central District. Um, that contributed much to the history and culture uh, of, this, of Seattle. Um, and so your support of that effort, I think, could also be, be very, um, I think, helpful um, as they seek to restore a sense of community and well being and showcasing the um, historic uh, cultural community that once thrived in the central district. So just wanted to mention that um, in case you were not aware of it. Thank you. And I think Judy, you were going to share something? Yeah, I'll pass. Okay. I do wanna, I do wanna um, say to um, 
Representative Santos, that I'm just, it was a pleasure hearing you speak and hear your ideas. And as a legislator, you know, maybe you can help capture some of this conversation. Thank you. Um, and I also want to thank Chuck for your comment that you put in the chat. Um, and I know that we're a, like a one minute over our time officially, so I won't read it, um, but I will save the chat. And like I said, for sure, follow up um, with all of the great resources and information that we did include here. Um, but before we log off, I want to just ask, is there anything else that anyone has to share? And if so, please unmute and share that. And then I want to toss it to Cynthia um, and would love to know what we here can do to support Vanishing Seattle's efforts moving forward. And I don't see a hand, so Cynthia. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you again for inviting me into the conversation. Um, it's always such a um, valuable opportunity to get to hear feedback from folks who've seen the films and learn about, you know, how they're landing. Um, I've been, yeah, it's going to be five years at the end of this month that I've been doing this work and I would love to um, continue to do a second series of films um, and just expand the work. So that's kind of led me to some um, <laughs> probably difficult choices coming up around, um, you know, work and stuff like that. So uh, if you feel so compelled, um, please feel free to donate at vanishingsettle.org. It feels a little crass and weird, like <laughs> putting that ask out there, but I'm trying to practice it. Um, I would also say, yeah, stay engaged with Vanishing Seattle. Feel free to, you know, message me, um, send me stories, pictures, tips. I really see it as a collective community-based project, and I can't do it without the support of, um, yeah, just, you know, y'all out there in the city. And um, yeah, kind of touching upon the last question. I mean, I think just continuing to have these conversations, engaging with the Seattle community, supporting small businesses, um, supporting arts nonprofits in Wanawari. Um, I don't know if you all have felt this way, but to me, it feels like this disaster gentrification is really going full steam and using the pandemic as an opportunity to <laughs> disappear more and more. Um, you know, beloved businesses and institutions and community spaces. I'm just totally overwhelmed more than ever in terms of sharing what people are sending to me in Vanishing Seattle. I can't keep up, which speaks to the volume. So to the extent that we can empower organizers and groups and folks who are, you know, not only trying to survive, but trying to make systems change. Um, so we can all have a say in determining what kind of city we want to live in. Um, yeah, I think we're just, you know, it's going to come from the ground up for as much as we can support each other in that work. Um, yes, an RIP to Two Bells and <laughs> so many other beloved places. But yeah, just I thank you all for your, for your interest and your commitments and welcome uh, future conversations and work. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. I will send a follow up email, um, of course, with Cynthia's information and all of the resources, like I said, were, that were shared in the chat today. I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us um, and for sharing. Thank you, Representative Santos, for coming. Um, it's really cool to have my representative at an event. So I uh, really appreciate you for taking time out of your day to contribute to our conversation. And um, our next Building Dialogue discussion will be in March, March 10th, the second Wednesday of the month, um, also at 5.30. So stay tuned for um, updates about that as well as the assignment for our next discussion. Please take care of yourselves and we will see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.